Hello everybody, welcome to the amazing show Free Woman. Today we have a special guest, Saida Desilees. And you can read her bio, bio somewhere here around the video. But now I will ask her to introduce herself. So, Saida, who are you and what are you doing and why? Thank you, Coco. First of all, I just want to thank you for inviting me to be on your show. It's such a pleasure to be part of the free women in the world and what you're doing is really gorgeous. So I just wanted to thank you for that opportunity. And I'm a, um, an author, I have a PhD in transpersonal psychology and my greatest passion is being an advocate for women's erotic genius, for the aspect of our nature that's so integrated and so natural and yet we're disconnected from it. So that part, that voice is what I'm advocating in the world as well as a practice called the Jadig practice, which is a way in which we can tune into that voice. So I have sort of two voices in the world right now. And um, my greatest passion also in the moment is to remind women that pleasure isn't actually a currency. It's not um, something that we need to trade or get from someone else. It's actually a human birthright. and by tuning into our pleasure, by actually taking time every day, even just a little bit, we actually feed the whole um, neural system, the brain, the being, our hearts, with the ability, literally, to activate our genius in the world so that we can come out with our gifts and offer that freely to people. So I'm quite an advocate for doing that through the lens of sexuality and sensuality. Yes, and I think this is so amazing and I think this might be totally new also to our viewers mm. because this concept is really not so popular, especially in Europe and in Germany. I see this in America, it's rising, but um, just tell us a little bit more about your own journey. How did you find pleasure? Did you always, did you always be a pleasurable kid and how was your life? Okay, so... Yes, as a child, I was very blessed with parents who refused to eradicate my erotic innocence. And we all have erotic innocence. It's something that we're born with. It's just that the way we socialize, get socialized, we tend to eradicate it. And I'll talk about that later with you. Um, so my childhood was one where I had a lot of love. I was wanted. Uh, my wildness was supported. I was given a structure of boundaries, obviously, to deal with the world and protect myself and, you know, not necessarily be masturbating in public places <laughs> because, you know, that when you're free and you're radically innocent as a child, you don't understand those things. So I had to learn those things. And then as a teenager, my main job with my friends was to listen to their relationship problems and their sensuality problems. Um, I myself was a late bloomer in terms of being sexual with other people, but I was intensely sexual with myself my entire life. Um, very, very expressed. I just never thought I was having orgasms. And I never thought I was having orgasms because of the definition that was offered to me through the dictionary, because that's all I had access to as a child. And I went, well, that's not what's happening in my body. And then many years later, thankfully, I realized that the definition we currently hold on orgasm is so finite and so limited, it wasn't inclusive of my big experience. And I was having a lot of orgasms. They were just not in that little narrow box that was presented to yeah. me. Not the masculine way, only in one spot at a special time. <laughs> yeah, or just even a very, um, a very functional way, Coco, where you know it's a medical definition of these nerves fire and then these signals happen and then these muscles contract and then you have you know orgasm. It, it's like very mechanic and, and machine. And yes, structurally those things happen, but there's just so much more to orgasm than than that. So. Um, and, it, and then I had a really violent experience in my early 20s where I almost died from um, a sexual trauma. And that led me on the path, actually, to conscious sexuality and he really healing my body and integrating my heart profoundly with my sexuality and my sensuality. And you would think that that was already in place with the kind of upbringing I had, but it wasn't because socially... I was already being conditioned of what it looks like to be a woman in the world. So that traumatic experience set me 
on an incredible path of relearning profound trust in my own body, relearning new definitions for sexuality, and then I came across this odd um, ancient Taoist practice called the Jade Egg, and I started doing this practice, and the things that were happening to me were so phenomenal that um, women were starting to notice, and they're like, you have to teach us, and at that time, I wasn't really uh, qualified to teach, but there was so much demand, and so I stepped into that role and eventually got all the different qualifications all the way up to a PhD, um, just because what I realized is this information is so vital, Coco. Every woman needs to know this. It's essential. Mm. It's, it's, like, it's like breathing and eating. Like, this information is so important. And what I realized is it was not accessible to most ladies and that there was this extreme polarity in this information. There was this whole medical perspective and most of that is very clinical and very dry and disease oriented. And yes. then we have the, what I call like, the woo-woo side, the, <laughs> the whole new age cult of sexuality, which yeah. has come up with these really incredible ideas that are actually not grounded in, in reality or truth. And so I was one of those people kind of stuck in between because I was wanting to explore these ancient teachings and, and yet my own physical body, my being was going, this is wrong. This isn't working in my feminine body. And then the medical stuff was like, ugh, that's just, it's interesting, but it's not inspiring. It makes me afraid of sexuality, actually. So having to define for myself and then really wanting to find a language, a common language for women, just like you and me, who aren't all into the hype, who aren't, you know, just clutching on to the powers of the medical uh, field, um, although I do respect it and I use information from there, but we're, we're interested in the innate sovereignty of our sexuality, the deep wisdom that naturally lives in our body. We're interested in knowing ourselves outside of what everybody else thinks we should know. Yes, and this is so genius because you were listening to your body, getting information wherever it felt for you, and then you back-checked your body, your brain, and everything. And then from this, you found the truth. And this is so amazing because I also know you work, and I also have the j <laughs> <laughs> And I have read your book. Um, after, um, after I launched my blog, I was online, and then I found you, and I was... I just amazed about I wanted to know what is she doing what is this and this jade egg I, it was always in my head because I was addicted to being the best lover when I was a kid mm. <laughs> a young girl and I was always putting it away but because you were so yes you were like speaking the truth and you you you, you had the experience that was really like I, I trust you so I, my body and my mind knew we trust you. And uh, when I read your book, it's really like exactly what I was experiencing as the truth, like the sensuousness, feeling, that feeling is the, a better way to uh, meditate than just listening to your breath or thinking a mantra or something that is really disconnecting you. So that through feeling, we can find like the truth. <laughs> and it sounds woo-woo, of course, but, but we know what we mean. <laughs> it's not woo-woo because if you look at um, our senses, mm -hmm. the senses are, is what makes sense of reality, right? Yeah. We, we take in this thing called the world or reality through our senses, and those are the filters in which we currently make sense of reality. So our sensuality... Our sensuality is the way that we make sense of reality. It's the way we interface with reality. This isn't woo-woo. This is actually how the human being is designed to function in this world for, um, for forever, since we were born here. We've moved away from it. We've not recognized it, which is why I also advocate you know, natural wildness in women and in men. Um, but that topic itself triggers a lot of fear and triggers a lot of judgment because, gosh, you know, wildness, then the whole world's going to fall apart if women, all women become wild. Um, and so my answer to that is if you look at a lioness, she knows exactly how to protect her cubs. She does not abandon her cubs, and she is very sovereign 
and knows how to take care of herself. And she's connected to the world. She knows what's going on. Wildness doesn't mean like disheveled hair and running around half naked and, and humping everything that you know comes into sight. I mean, it may for some people, but <laughs> for the majority of people, that's that's not the truth. Wildness right. is what's innately true for you outside of your domestication, outside of your conditioning. And sexuality is a realm where human beings have tremendous amount of conditioning. Yes, and of course, if you can have it all, if you know that you are wild and free, you don't want everything, you know? So um, I have a free relationship with my husband, and whenever I tell a guy uh, that I have it, I don't tell it so much, but now I do it on YouTube. <laughs> But, uh, and then they say, oh, well, then we could have sex. But I say, mm, but I don't want to have sex with everybody. It's, yeah. it's, I, I can have it, but I prefer not to have it all the time yeah. because I just choose. I choose what I like and I just rest in myself. And this is so amazing. I think humans just got so obsessed with the mind because once they got it, they were just like, oh, my God. And then it ran wild and they forgot all their wild stuff inside their inner wisdom, the, everything they already had that was so great. Mm. And I think now is the perfect time to see, wow, oh, I have this and I have this. And that's why I love you because you already met the intelligence and the mind with the heart and soul and all this wisdom. Mm. So cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you bring up, you bring up a topic that I'd cover in my book. Um, I have a philosophy called The Art of Succulent Living. And one of the chapters in that section of the book looks at um, conscious choices. And conscious choices can create the most incredible life for a person. But to become conscious in our choices is a little journey. So um, I bring it up even though we're talking about sexuality, because being able to consciously choose, and this means when you, like you said, when you are a free person, this does not mean you do not have boundaries. Yeah. Right? So what I've noticed and what's frightened me, and I've had to help a lot of women recover from this, is there will be um, certain groups where um, it's like open group, sexual experiences, for example. And for the most part, everyone's happy to be there, but there might be a person there who feels like, um, and she has the pressure of the group saying, if her genitals are not available to the group, she's actually shut down sexually. Well, I'm very expressed sexually. I'm not making my genitals available to every person on the planet just because I'm supposed to be free. Um, that is not true. So again, I want to bring it back to that lioness. Boundaries are healthy. Boundaries help us um, make choices that when we wake up the next day, we feel so happy about. We're like, yes, I'm so glad I made that choice. Not the kind of choice of like, yeah. oh God, what did I just do? I can't believe I did that. Um, so yes. the and ability, the choice, yeah, oh, go ahead. And the choice is made inside. So mm. our body knows, our feeling or our soul knows what is the right thing. Mm. And I think if we just evaluate it with the brain, like, because I have also uh, been very, very evil to myself. Like I wanted to be the most uh, free woman on earth. I was so emancipated and everything. And I abused my body sexually because I thought now I go and I fuck. Uh, <laughs> every man because I'm so free and then like uh, people in my uh, school they were judging me oh, yeah, she's a slut but I said no I'm a free woman and I will show you all and uh, I was all, I think I was abusing myself because my body didn't want this right my, it was just like like a misinformed wrong brain decision and but I was so disconnected from my body I was really oh my god so you bring up another awesome point, um, Coco, and it's part of that conscious choice chapter again. And, and it, well, it has to do with integrity. It has to do with, and to me, integrity is when the voice of our mind, like our consciousness, our awareness, is um, a match to what we are sensing in our heart, our feeling nature. And it's a match to what our genitals are saying. Because trust me, they never, ever lie. I know that might sound a bit hokey, but in working with tens of thousands of women around the world, 
this is the one fundamental truth that I know for sure. They never, <laughs> ever lie. And so the journey or the, the invitation is allow your mind to come up with what it wants. Allow your heart to feel exactly what she's feeling. And allow your genitals, that primal, instinctual pulse, to feel as well. And then look, are they a match? Maybe the heart and the mind are both a yes, and the, are the genitals I call yoni, the yoni is like, nah, then I don't move forward. Or maybe the yoni and the heart are like, yeah, 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 but the mind's like, wait a second. Then I also don't move forward mm -hmm. until I have an alignment, until I have an integrity. And so part of all of this is as we explore, because sexuality is now blossoming, it's now being explored more and more in so many facets, and that's quite exciting. But what happens when we explore sexuality without having the balance of an emotional maturation process? where you're growing the sexual energy, you're allowing that to be expressed in the world, you, you're giving voice to that, you're saying yes to it, you're doing the practices that allow your body to open up maybe in ways maybe you've never had in your life. You're doing that work simultaneous to doing your emotional work so that mm -hmm. you're not manipulating with your sexuality. And trust me, I've yeah. done a lot of this in my past. Me especially, too. Where... <laughs> I didn't feel good about myself, so I would go out and seduce somebody for self-esteem issues. Yeah. Or yeah. Um, I would have sex with my partner, but it was more to relieve some tension that I was feeling than deeply connecting with the person. And there's nothing really wrong with those actions. It's owning that that's what I'm doing that was key. Make sense? Yes. So it's not that we have so to me. change our behavior so much, but if we could own the behavior, like, oh, look at me, I'm doing this thing because I need some boost to my self-esteem, or look at me, I'm trying to release some tension right now. And when we own it, then the integrity comes in and we feel a lot better about ourselves. Yes, and also uh, women are really able to break men's hearts very badly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like, when, when we are raised, like, in a not very loving way, then we are, like, I would did this uh, that I, I I had this. I was addicted to making men love me, mm. and I, I feel now very very guilty. And it was just it felt just so good, but at the end it's not it's not good because it's it's hurtful. I think that's a natural evolution, Coco. So. Um, you remember I was saying like the erotic genius, and there's like actually stages of development to the erotic genius, and the you know the. The preliminary stages are erotic innocence. Everybody has it. You're like a little baby, and every part of your body is like enlivening. It is, it's so connected to life that everything is like, ooh, ah, mm. You know, it, there's no separation and there's no isolation into genitalia at that point. It's inclusive of that, but, but the whole body is, is open to um, deep sensuality. And then there's a um, erotic activation which is natural to all teenagers we go through this intense and we're talking <laughs> really intense time of life where the hormonal soup is so thick that we are really are insane there there is a factor of the mind that is just not functioning um, with a degree of consciousness that <laughs> <laughs> that would make wise choices, and that's okay because it's a learning that sexuality is actually powerful, and we mm -hmm. kind of start to see what's out in the world, and we start to you know it's a it's an important phase of yeah. development, and then there's like erotic um, exploration, which is the phase that people go through at some point where they're like, hey, um, I have this erotic energy, and I want to explore it, even if it's just with one person. Or if it, it's 2,000, it doesn't matter. There's this phase of exploring. And I really feel that's a crucial phase because in that phase, we start to know what we like and what we don't like and what's amazing and what's really awful for ourselves. And we, it's a very important time to be in a non-judgmental state and just pure, like, well, let's try that. What's that about? And, hmm, like, maybe this is interesting. And then there's a phase where there's, um, you're activating a little bit more uh, 
like the con erotic consciousness. It's like the, it, it's the phase where you start to be attracted to Tantra or Taoism or some kind of like alternative way of looking at sexuality that could make it quote unquote sacred. Or there's, there's a part of you suddenly that's going, you know, there's more to sex than just sex. There, there's something else I'm missing. It's not fulfilling me anymore. And in that stage, um, sexuality and exploration, it may not, um, it, it could calm down a bit, but what happens is it's more an internal exploration. <clears throat> You're becoming much more aware of your the subtle energies, the subtle sensations, which are actually not so subtle <laughs> when we activate them. Yes, or, or also healing. Mm -hmm. A lot of emotional tur turmoil. Yeah, so a because lot of healing. Because I started uh, because I saw, oh my God, sex has the power of healing and I wanted to know more about it. Yes. So that's the phase, that's the, the, the phase of that particular erotic journey, let's say. And then the final mm -hmm. sort of phase that I've understood is erotic wisdom. And it's the place where we literally are sexually sovereign beings, where we don't look externally anymore for information or validation. We actually are self, we're, we're very self, um, we self-generate pleasure, meaning like, we become our birthright, which is omni-orgasmic. We return to like the very beginning of life <laughs> when we were omni-orgasmic as babies. So we suddenly realize, wow, I'm omni-orgasmic. This means that any part of my body can elicit delight and pleasure. And, and I'm suddenly not restricted to humans. It's suddenly like a sunset can be orgasmic. A smell can be orgasmic. A flavor in my mouth can be... Suddenly, you, your spectrum of pleasure becomes what it always was anyways. It's like you suddenly tune in. You're like, oh, I have a greater range than I thought. And then the wisdom comes in where you will not compromise your aliveness. You will not in, make choices in life that kill your aliveness and your turn on. You're over that phase. Um, but you're also not willing to annihilate yourself through pleasure. So there's um, a little bit more insight and understanding. Well, that pleasure is great, but it leaves me feeling like crap afterwards. So it's mm -hmm. actually not a viable pleasure for me to, at this time. I've, I've done it, I've explored it, but it's actually quite draining. Whereas this pleasure over here, I have, I'm a little bit of that and I'm good for like months. So... Um, those are the stages or the phases of the erotic genius, but the whole time it's present in our being. And I think it's so beautiful that we give ourselves the opportunity to just be where we're at right now and be okay with it. And you say, wow, this is, this is me, and, and recognize that our own eros, our own aliveness, is what keeps us purring. It's what gives us inspiration to do what we're here to do in the world. And it's a really vital energy. Whether, like you said, it's for healing, and it's for creativity, it's for actually procreation, like if you're wanting to make a family. It doesn't matter how you use it. But when you start to use it, really understanding, wow, this is me. This is my energy. This is my gift to me and my gift to the world. And you have respect for it. You'll never, ever <clears throat> bargain for sex or love again. You will not um, be succumbed to all the things that are... I mean, sex is the highest selling way for marketing at yeah. this point. It's, it, we've made sexuality a, com a commodity, a currency. It's not. It's a birthright. And so when we do have that switch, that flip, we're like, it's a birthright, and I don't need your cheap stuff. <laughs> I already yes. have it in me. It's here. I don't need that stuff. I don't give you all my money just because you're telling me that your thing is going to give me more pleasure. Um, yes. That's so important when people start to wake up to that. Yes, and I have the feeling that um, everybody of us, we are shut down to society or whatever, and we don't allow ourselves for pleasure. So I'm constantly opening and opening always for more and always when I feel like, oh my God, this is like forbidden and I see I want to go back, I want to go away, you know? And it's really like, no, no, I have to open, I have to open. It's really hard to work to open more and more because it keeps getting, becoming more. 
and this is very important and I see when we all like shut down and then we see like something sexy bling bling and we want it and it's like so somehow it's somehow like the blind uh, wanting the blind or something like it's you know because it's blind people doing this stuff and blind people but everybody of us we have this tingling somehow in, in us we know this is somehow connecting us to the truth but like this we will never get any satisfaction right and you know numbness is a function of living in this kind of world um, that we've created modern society numbness it's almost impossible not to numb because um, a lot of the stimulation that's coming in is quite traumatic to our instinctual self or animal self if you want to call it that um, it's offensive. I mean, we are creatures that love beauty in nature organically. If you think of how long human beings have existed outside of cities before cities came to be, it's a very long history. So we are a pre um, determined to enjoy and be healed and inspired by nature. In fact, every time I step into nature, I get turned on. <laughs> it's this funny thing that happens. Yeah. Like, mm, I feel really alive. And here's the thing that I want to point out, just as a little caveat to that thought, is when we feel turned on, can we just enjoy that and be a sexual being? instead of always having to do something about that small moment of turn on. Because what happens is, with through the numbness, we can't, we're not tuned in, to this, we're sitting on such power. Like the pelvis, what it contains is incredible. So we're sitting on this, what I call the sleeping beauty. And she's snoring away down there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, Instead of like realizing that, oh, I could actually wake that up. We think that um, this little momentary outside thing is going to re relieve something for us. And just this little itch, like suddenly I've been sleeping, I'm numb, I'm numb, I'm sleeping, I'm numb. I'm like, oh, turned on. Okay, I got to do something about it. <laughs> right? Instead of turn on going, ooh, I really love feeling turned on. Oh, my God. It, it makes me feel alive. I feel and inspired. It's just okay. Yeah. yeah, and I don't actually need to do anything about yeah. this. And for the ladies this especially, so cool. we don't need to do anything about other people's turn on. So if you're mm -hmm. not in a state, a receptive state, or a state where you're wanting to be sensual or sexual with a person, and they're turned on, let them own that. That's theirs. We don't actually have to do anything about that. We also don't need to make them wrong about it. It's like... Oh, cool, you're having fun over there. I'm not going to join you, but I'm really glad for you, you know. <laughs> um. I love this. It's so counterculture. I love this. And I have also talked with uh, Jenna, um, but I don't know if I will mention this on YouTube, but uh, now I have mentioned it because I don't know which, di uh, which, which um, how I will place it, but now I have mentioned it again. <laughs> so I think I will cut this out, but maybe not. <laughs> no worries. But I love what you just said. This is so, I think I don't know any woman who thinks this way. So this is always like, like a point of discussion. So women always have, uh, when they sit together, they have like always these discussions about obligations, how to meet them and how they don't want to meet them and how to meet them anyway, you know? So it's always like in, this, in the circle and even in very conscious uh, circles. Yeah, so, so it's actually no one's fault, Coco. Here's what's really going on. From the day you are born as a woman into this world, there is a social structure that will bring you up a very specific way. No matter how free and great your parents are, it is not possible to escape it unless you were to live alone in the woods forever and ever. So you enter a world that has ideas and constructs of what it means to be a woman in the world and how that should function. And believe it or not, it happens right from birth in a very young girl who's awake and connected deeply into her own self, she's not separate from her body and her pleasure, is taught from a very young age to shut down the conscious connection with the body, which means every time she receives a pleasure signal, she can't allow herself to, to be aware of it. 
Yes. Yeah. So this is actually happening. This is how we socialize girls. We socialize girls out of noticing their arousal cues. This is not my work. This is other people's research. Um, but it's in alignment with what I'm doing because <laughs> the work that I'm doing is helping women return to hear, understand, heed, and enjoy all those arousal cues, everything that your body is saying. Now what's amazing, Coco, is they've done experiments where they take women, um, very expressed sexual women and women who are shut down, like a whole range of women, and they um, put an intravaginal device that is able to measure arousal. And then they, they make the women watch different types of movies, neutral movies, um, animals and nature having sex, and human beings having sex and then uh, violent movies. So these different films. That, you know, what was interesting is that women were aroused almost the, the, all the time. <laughs> but, but what was more interesting than that was the women didn't know. The women didn't actually know. Even the ones who were free and expressed and alive and like sexually liberated women still couldn't track all of their arousal cues. Because they, they, they would write on a piece of paper, like if they were feeling turned on, like, are you turned on or not? And they're like, no. But the device was going, rawr, 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 super turned on, super turned on, you know? And there was a, a missing link between the mind and the body. So that's, for me, I use um, somatic awareness to reconnect our conscious mind with the sensations that are happening and occurring in the genitals. And it's phenomenal when that starts to happen. And it's different for each of us, but the process is the same. But the result, like how we experience the change is different. And it's remarkable and exciting. I mean, I have helped women who've never had orgasms suddenly have full body orgasms. And we weren't focusing on that. That's yes. a side effect of just being able to drop in and feel in sense in a very specific way with there's, you know, physical practice and things like that but there's also intention. Um, I've helped yes. women who have, like, they're all the way in their mid-70s and they've been shut down sexually for years and they're dried out and nothing's working and hormonally they're, they're screwed up and blah, 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 blah. The whole story that we tell about elder women. And those same women after just three months, juicy, healthy, vibrant pelvises, they're so turned on, they get themselves younger boyfriends in their 50s and they're like, I cannot get enough of connecting with this person. And so I find that really exciting that within us is the solution. We don't need to look very far. We don't need lots of pharmaceuticals. I mean, I think now they're even, they've got this thing called the O-Shot that I'm outraged about. I'm absolutely outraged about this. It's $1,500 to get an injection in your vagina to make you more supposedly orgasmic. Oh, no. Um, but there's there's very like re oh very God. little real see, I like the devil <laughs> <laughs> well there's people who know how to make some good money um they're mm -hmm. they're they're banking on the fact that you are so disconnected from your body that you will look to expert solutions instead of to yourself what they don't tell you this is, is you really in the system yes. always like also when we go to the ja uh, gynecologist we also sit there okay tell me what's up, up with me Yes. It's always the same. And then, of course, this is leading to this, or like um, they are um, getting plastic surgery to look all like uh, perfect in a special shape they have seen on TV. <laughs> yeah. So, so mm. that's also incredible to me because what women are doing is they're cutting off erectile tissue. This is tissue that induces tremendous amount of pleasure and we're, we're removing it. So um, it's a rather, you know, I have a lot of, intensity around these things. We don't need to get into them now, but maybe another time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what I do want to say is that within um, every woman, even if she wasn't to follow my particular method, but she was just to today, after watching this interview, come home a little bit deeper into herself and even just place her hands on her body and go, hey, what is this amazing creature that I am? that I've forgotten, that maybe I've never even given myself permission to genuinely and deeply feel. 
What is this? Mm. Oh, I'm numb. I'm hurting. I'm this. I'm that. Stay with mm. it because the more we return some of the attention, you know, our attention is being pulled out all the time. Women pour attention out to everybody else, first of all, because we're very loving creatures. <laughs> we just like pour it out. But then, you know, all the internet, these things, we're just pulling our attention, very little attention going in. And trust me, just even a few moments, like 30 seconds of just going in, just saying hi. I'm willing to learn, I'm willing to connect. That alone starts a whole sequence of interesting processes in your body that will help open and activate things for you. So that's what I'm excited about. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. And instead of like five minute meditation practice, just five minute self love practice. You just uh, switch on um, a meditation app and then just five minutes just and see what comes up. You don't need to do anything, no mm -hmm. orgasm, anything. You just uh, think that feel good and pleasure is allowed. Mm. And, and you know, this is maybe just like the beginning and I am so curious, you have to tell me, so the women were aroused all the time or, or only at, at special events that were happening? This is really fascinating. So um, when you in, talk in about study, arousal... Hmm? In, in the study you're talking about? Hmm? Yes. Exactly. So, well, well, in the neutral movies there was no arousal, but with the, the mm. movies that were fear-based, where women would become afraid, or um, human sex or animal sex, in, in all those instances, there was arousal in the body. Um, there's a lot going on there. And again, that wasn't as intriguing to me as the fact that the women couldn't fig like feel yeah. that they were. That was intriguing. Yeah. And I don't know if that they couldn't feel it or because of the socialization, you're not allowed to feel turned on about that. That's not mm. okay. You and should. if I write this down, what will they think about me? <laughs> so it's unconscious. It's not even in the conscious thought. It's, it's like so ingrained in there that we just, arousal wants to emerge and flood the body. And before it even can get a millimeter into the system, there's a shutdown process. And mm. this is actually serious for women who are in relationships, they're in love, they, they really want to enjoy sex. And they're even told that they look like they're enjoying sex and they're told that they look like they're having orgasms and they themselves are not enjoying their own orgasms. It's that mechanism. So mm. through that, it's, it's a reason why I'm not into hyper fast solutions around this because we're mm. literally needing to repattern a the cellular memory of the genitals. The yeah. genitals store, like every experience you've ever had is stored in there. Yeah. So we want to repattern that cellular memory. And then we're literally re imprinting and even growing new neural pathways to develop mm -hmm. the consciousness and the awareness between the mind, the brain, and the body about all this full spectrum of pleasure, not just big clitoral orgasms or G-spot mm. orgasms, but everything else that's also in there, the full range. And that is really uh, worthy of taking the time to investigate because then it's with you for the rest of your life. And I find that phenomenal and exciting. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I could go on about this with you forever, but I also have a, like a structure in the series, and I want to ask you, how do you spend your life? So uh, ah. your day. So how do you wake up? What do you do? Because uh, it's always interesting. Because women would say, of course she can do pleasure all the time, but I have to work and I have kids. So how do you spend your life because you're also building this career and you're bringing your wisdom out into the world so you're also working yes. <laughs> i assume yes. no I, I do work um what's important to me is when i years ago when i first started this i was a uh, extreme type a i still am which means uh, you know i do 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 i'm a high achiever i want to you know extreme type a and so what I would do is I would work really hard and I would burn out and I would go on a holiday and I'd literally sleep 18 hour days, recover, and then go back to work, 
work really hard and then pay for another freaking holiday that I would just sleep in. And I wasn't actually enjoying my life. I wasn't actually enjoying anything because I was going through recovery and burnout, that cycle. So when I became aware that there was another way, meaning when the jade egg came into my life and a lot of things kind of started waking up in my being around it, I went, okay, let's do an experiment. Let's see how effective and productive I can be, but not through burnout. Let's actually see that if I take care of me, what will happen? And what was amazing, Coco, as I made time to take care of me, I was actually more productive than ever before, and I was working less hours. And the way I explain it is before I had, if you imagine that your life, you have like 12 powerful horses and they're, they're, they're going to pull you forward to wherever you want to go, except for the fact that they're all running in different directions. So you're desperately trying to control these horses and you're not getting anywhere and you're really tired. The practice, taking time for myself, started to realign those horses so they all lined up and suddenly they were responsive to the most subtle um, amount of indication from me, which took very little energy, and we would fly. And that was life-changing. So I'm talking about this because I've been doing this for almost two decades. So it's, I have an ingrained habit of doing this, but I wasn't always like this. So I want to mention that to create a bridge between women who are those high achievers and they go, 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 and they do, 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 and they're trying so hard and they're so exhausted. And that's the recipe for failure at some point because you're going to probably hurt yourself or get sick or your partner's going to leave you or you'll have a miscarriage or things happen when women get really distressed. And, yes, I, and they also don't know what they really want. Yeah. So they're maybe running after wrong uh, things. Because also this is like what I have done and since I am taking conscious time for myself, I saw, oh my god, this is something in my life, I don't want this. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just don't do it, I, I find a way to, to get rid of it and I can sit down and plan and this is just such a more effective way. I love this horse thing, but I think it should, could be also very like uh, making the women afraid. Oh my God, the horses, <laughs> you know, so yeah. how can I align them that she did this somehow? Right, so and it's really, it's, it's my analogy because it's how I felt. I was mm -hmm. so tired of pulling all these things to make stuff happen. And I'd effort so hard to make it happen. Sexual energy is our creative energy. It's what creates life in the world, quite literally, can create a human being. But when you're not creating a human being, it's our creativity. So what happened when I started to harness that energy? I started to actually um, do specific things that I was enjoying for myself that kind of brought all that scattered practice into a more focused place. Then you're right, Coco. Mm. What would emerge is clarity. I mean, I mm. used to, I was so talented. I was like an actress. I was running a martial arts school. I was a dive master. I was running my own holistic health practitioner thing. I mean, I was doing so, I was a professional belly dancer all at the same time. And one day I sat back and I'm like, I'm really good at a lot of things, but what do I really want to do? And, that, and I wasn't able to get to that space until I could come deep into myself. That's the point I'm trying to make. So the routine I have mm -hmm. now is, is respectful of that. It, if I don't have a lot of time in the morning, I still make sure I don't, you know, the first thing I do is get on the phone. Mm. My phone, I, I put on airplane mode, and it doesn't come on until I'm ready to, like, let the world invade my space. You. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I take yeah. a little bit of time, even whether it's five minutes or a couple hours, it doesn't matter, just to connect in with me. And my main question is, what would my pleasure love today? Like, what, what would really delight me? And sometimes my day is so full and crazy, I'm like, gosh, it's hard to think, think of something. I don't want to do any of this stuff, but I need to. And what would, would delight me? I'd really love a delicious shower right now, where I just really enjoy it. 
and I do a body scrub. And so I do those things for myself where I engage my sensuality, whether I give myself a foot massage or a great shower or jump on my man or, you know, whatever it is that I'm choosing in those moments. Um, and then I have a very busy day. I tend to spend a lot of time writing and creating. And then I have a team that I'm working with that I help direct and we meet and uh, or doing interviews like this or putting programs together. It's very full, full days. And what I try to do is every 50 minutes, I stop what I'm doing. I have a timer. I get up and I move. I stretch. I bounce on a rebounder, have some water, have a snack, get outside for a few breaths, do something, especially if I'm on the computer a lot, and then I go back. Um, and this helps my energy stay really alive. The other thing I love to do if I have the privacy to do it is I like to self-pleasure <laughs> different times of the day. Sometimes it could be as simple as just wearing my egg and then giving it some squeezes and just kind of generating this, mm, okay, more energy. And sometimes it is um, allowing myself to have a, an orgasm or three um, just because it's a way that I have found keeps me creative, keeps me alive, and then I'm not building this um, tension that happens in the body when we don't express our sexuality. And although yes. I have an incredible partner and he's an incredible lover, I don't rely on him to fulfill me every moment of the day. Um, I really do. And it's do. also different things. Yes. I think self pleasuring is really a very grounding um, practice. Yes. Where it keeps me on the ground, on the earth, here, living in yes. this. And uh, currently I'm in a house um, where there's a 16-month-old baby. And so a chunk of my day is I get to play with him. I get to sometimes look after him. Um, and I am loving loving being like he interrupts me all the time in the middle of really important things and he comes up and he's like ball <laughs> and I love it because I take it as a moment to be really present and I just stop what I'm doing yes. for a few moments I play with him and then off he goes and I come back to what I'm doing and I'm relieved to have this kind of aliveness that fleshes in through through having a child around um, not a mother myself but I'm often around a lot of children so it's, it's really lovely to be part of a community to raise one child. I mean, it requires a lot of energy to raise a child. So that's, that's probably another thing that if I were to have children, I would want to have a, a community around that the child wouldn't be just relying on me um, for its information and its play and, and all of that. Um, a few more things that I do for myself is I really love to... Well, I meditate a lot. I dance. Um, I, I have to get out into nature. I have to. It's like non-negotiable. And when I don't, I feel like it's a part of me that hasn't been fed. Yeah. There really is. And, I mean, this could be another interview, but I spent, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness, like pure wilderness with like lions and like things that could eat you and had incredible experiences and I started to understand our relationship with wilderness nature and our own nature in such a profound way that now I, it's almost not quite a religious experience but it's like really important it's something it's yes. key because it informs everything else in my life it really does I also love to read inspiring thoughts and ideas from other people and I love to be with precious people in my life outside of on the phone or on the computer or on the internet. I want to be with a real person. Yeah. And show my vulnerability and, and witness theirs and celebrate their successes and really be in the deep space when they're going through something or I'm going through something. Having a real human connection. I think that's really missing in our lives. That yes. That we, we really connect with real People. And then we're limbically, like we're actually touching, we're, we're inducing oxytocin and these other great hormones by physical connection, a hug, or just going on a hike, or dancing together, or whatever it might be. So, so important. So, so important. Yes. Oh, I want to invite you for the next interview already, because <laughs> uh, I have read your blog about this nature in Africa. And I was, my, my entire body was like, ah, this is the truth. And because I, I have never been in such a wilderness, but sometimes I'm, I'm like, I have this on the beach. And now, oh, my soul lives here. 
<laughs> and then I know all the other times I felt it my soul, my soul, it was not here because this is the reality. Mm. And this is so, I want to know this more, but uh, in another interview, oh, you're so full of everything. And <laughs> I, <laughs> When we say that in North America, it's not normally a compliment. <laughs> when we say it to someone, you're so full of something. <laughs> so you're making no, me laugh. You Thank mean. you. Well. <laughs> Thanks, God. I'm not American, so I can yes. say this. <laughs> yes. And um, let me read my questions. Ah, yes. And also, um, I want to ask you for three books that you really, really love, that really have changed your life? Mm. Well, years and years and years and years ago, we're talking when I was very first starting exploring what femininity is and being a woman and Sark, the succulent wild woman book. The way it's written, it's all messy and colorful and there was a few things in that book that stood out and it was just giving herself permission to, to have the desires that she had in the moment and to just be who she was in the moment as a messy person. Um, she wasn't always needing to be perfect. Um, and she was inviting our own kind of natural creative deliciousness to emerge. It's like, oh, I know I shouldn't be eating chocolate because I need to watch my waist, but God, the feeling on my lips and the taste in my mouth. And I just start like, yes, that's it. <laughs> just really giving permission to women um, to really love and enjoy their sensuality. So that book was very impactful. And I'm actually still in contact with her. I reached out to her and just said, you know, you've so influenced my life to the point where I wrote a philosophy called The Art of Succulent Living. And I just want to thank you. And, and she was so generous and amazing. Um, about that. So that's one of the books I loved. Um, a more recent book I read, it's not an easy read because it literally will flip between the man's right brain and his left brain. So you're in this deep sort of sensual descriptive experience in the book and suddenly boom you're in the left brain and he's explaining what's going on and then back in this, I liked it. And it was called Becoming Animal. Um, I can't actually remember the the um, author's name at this point, mm -hmm. but um, Becoming Animal, and it was profound for me. I mean, he, he even describes gravity as uh, one of the ways that we have erotic relationship with the earth. Is, is I know this feeling. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so the more we come into our own animal self, and then he says, do you actually think that everything out there is inert? that when you reach out and touch a leaf, you're the one reaching out and touching, maybe the leaf is also reaching out and touching you back and feeling into you. I mean, it was so phenomenal, this book, and it really, then once I went into the wilderness, I had, I had those experiences. I was like, wow. <laughs> Every single moment was ecstatic. And um, so that book was very, very instrumental for me. Wow. And on a more practical book, I really loved uh, Christian Northrup's Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. Um, read it years and years and years ago because I had a lot of difficulties with my body initially just with because of the rape. And then I had like so many things that had happened in my body that were difficult. Um, reading that book was such a great healing experience. And then years and years later, I ended up being able to contribute to the new version of it which is, was like a phenomenal thing. So that particular book, I think, is a great starting place for women because it's written by a doctor, a gynecologist, an OBGYN, who understands that you're not just physical body parts. She understands that you're a psychosexual being. This isn't my terms or her terms. It's a, it's a term that's out there um, in the professional realm. And what that means is that your psyche, your emotions, your consciousness is infused into every fiber of your physicality and there's no separation. And so she addresses medical issues from that viewpoint with real solutions and so that book was very instrumental uh, as well in my journey. 
Wow, and she's like also on the same path because she's uh, crossing, uh, closing the gap between this wild wisdom that we all somehow have. So we all get goosebumps when we hear it because we mm -hmm. know, oh, there's truth inside. And then also like the uh, Western medicine um, yes. mind and yes. wow, my vocabulary is lacking, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. And I think that's why I'm attracted to women like her is. I have a need for things to be concrete in reality. They're grounded in something. It's not just made up out of, I don't know, fantasy land. But then there's yeah. also a connection with uh, a deeper meaning that we may not be able to concretize. So what I mean by that is I like having functional, a functional way of looking at things. Oh, you know, this hormone does that and this ligament in the uterus does this. You know, understanding those bits and pieces are fabulous. But we're more than just bits and pieces. So then being able to bridge that to the deeper meaning of who am I as a being and, and why is it that I was gifted this incredible pleasure system that's literally unlimited and every time I use it in, in a way that's um, what, what I call relaxed arousal, every time I have relaxed arousal occurring in my body my brain like really lights up and I suddenly have more creativity and more self-esteem and I'm actually more expressed in my genius in the world than I've ever been before. Like, why is that occurring? That's so curious to me, so. <laughs> yes, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you very much, Saida, for being here, my guest. I'm so honored to have you because I have really like so much uh, all for you and I'm so happy that you came and everybody I will link to Saida's uh, book and program and everything so you can find her below please check her out because it's totally totally important and uh, yes if you like this show and if you have questions and whatever just write down in the comments and maybe Saida will also come around because she also has a YouTube channel where she's sharing monthly Sanchez tips no not Sanchez tips what is it called delicious tips delicious tips <laughs> but of course they're Sanchez <laughs> and um, uh, you will also come and uh, maybe answer some questions mm -hmm. and otherwise go to her channel and connect with her because she's amazing and she's really there. Yes, she's answering the questions. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, so goodbye, everybody. Bye, wonderful. <laughs> you. And thanks again for having me, Coco.